We grow when we give. We grow when we give. We grow when we give. Nosotros crecemos cuando damos. We grow when we give. We grow when we give. Welcome to ROG, Return on Generosity. I'm your host, Shannon Cassidy. This podcast celebrates generosity at work, not financial giving. Giving valuable time, mutual respect, alternative perspectives, and genuine collaboration. Women's History Month is a celebration of women's contributions to history, culture, and society, and has been observed annually in the month of March in the United States since 1987. ROG is dedicating March to women's history and the essential role that women play worldwide. Our special guest today is Shirley Powell, SVP Communications and Industry Relations for Cox Automotive. We've been close personal friends and colleagues for many years. Something I admire about you, Shirley, is your genuine authenticity, your willing to stand up for what you believe in, and your openness to hearing others. I'm so grateful for our friendship and this opportunity to explore this with you. Welcome to ROG, Shirley. Oh, thank you, Shannon. This is uh, super exciting for me to be here. You know how I feel about you personally. But as we were talking before we hit record, I this is my first time actually doing a podcast because my job is usually to be helping our executives and I'm behind the scenes helping them do these kinds of things. I've never actually done it myself. So this is a treat. Yes. And I was saying to you that I think it's going to be a little bit difficult to talk about this just because I think it's a part of who you are. I don't think it's something you're, maybe you're more intentional about it than I've observed, but I think it's a part of your leadership style is to be generous, like the way that you help executives at your organization. And I think it's an opportunity for us to learn more about how you do that and what that feels like. So before we dive in, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, I am um, a mother of two college age students. Uh, My husband and I have been married. It'll be 28 years this year. And I've spent most of my career in one industry. I spent most of my career in the media industry. And uh, in my last role, the, the company got sold and all of the uh, executive jobs were eliminated. And I thought, well, what am I going to do next? And I got a call from from Cox Automotive. And, you know, speaking of generous uh, and generosity, I said to them when they called me, I said, well, I don't know anything about automotive, um, but I do have, you know, 25 years of communications experience. And honestly, that's really what they needed. And that's what they were looking for. So I was able to switch industries uh, later in my career. Though, you know, honestly, I really have had the same job for 30 years, different levels, different companies companies, different brands, different executives, but I've really done the same thing for 30 years. So I have brought a wealth of communications experience into a new industry and it's gone beautifully. I was born and raised in a little town outside of Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania called Kingston, Pennsylvania. It's in the northeast part of the state uh, up by the Pocono Mountains. And interestingly enough, I went to high school with a gentleman who works at my company. He's the COO of Cox Communications, which is our our other division. And he and I graduated not only from the same high school, we graduated from the same class of the same high school. (laughs) So crazy, crazy small world. Oh my gosh. It is, right? How those circles kind of keep looping back around. Oh, that's incredible. Well, thank you for that background and just a little glimpse of, you know, what has contributed to your career and your life experience and the kind of wisdom that you're sharing with us. Yeah, and I think a big part of my background, and honestly, um, this is something that's taken me a long time to get comfortable with talking about, but a big part of my background is I grew up in a very, very blue collar area, a blue collar family. Both my grandfathers died in the coal mines. And my parents neither had went past eighth grade in terms of education. And so um, I didn't grow up in a, uh, a, um, a family that higher education or being an executive not only was not talked about, it, it was like a different planet. I mean, it would, it would be like landing on a different planet. So, so I grew up in a, in a, in a very working class area. And I was the first one in my family to graduate college. So 
um, you know, very, very different than, than my background. And how does that inform your perspective on things now, do you think, Shirley? Oh my goodness, I think it informs everything. And again, it took me, uh, I turned uh, 56 this year and it's probably taken me until I was 50 to really be comfortable talking about it. I think, you know, it's similar to what uh, Brene Brown talks about so often about the shame. And I think I felt, I just felt embarrassed by it. It wasn't something I was comfortable talking about and people would ask me, you know, what did your parents do? And, you know, and most people in the executive ranks, you know, have come from different backgrounds. And so it really informs everything because I am so much more, I think, uh, kind and generous with people who are not of a privileged background. And I think it's, I always look to connect with people that are coming up whether it's a, you know a waitress at a at a restaurant or the staff in our cafeteria or the security team i mean i i'm very conscious of always being kind and generous to them and saying hello and and acknowledging them and looking them in the eyes and and making contact um those are the people that I relate to more than I do relate to, uh, you know, our senior executives. It's taken me, I've had to work at relating to our senior executives. Mm. And that's so interesting. Thank you for sharing that and your willingness to put that out there. And I wonder what that has freed up in you when now that you're open to expressing it and you're sharing that with others, like you're really hearing people and as personal friends, we've shared some of our flaws and imperfections with each other. And anytime I've shared that with you, you've always responded with something very kind and empathetic and like, I get it. I've been there. You know, I feel that. Um, and I, I think as leaders, we can take that into our daily practice with our teams and our peers, the people that we get to work with and really be present and listening and humble to say like, yeah, I hear you. I get it. Even if I haven't had the same lived experience, I'm, I'm connecting with you. Yes. I, I absolutely feel uh, empathetic because I, because of my life experiences. I also really, really enjoy people and I enjoy their stories and I want to hear everyone's story. I was in a running group and I would come home and I would tell my husband like, oh, I ran with this person and they told me their whole life story. And I mean their whole life story. I would hear everything. And he would say, how how long have you known this person? I'm like, oh no, I just met her this morning. I actually couldn't even tell you her name. I don't even know her name, <laughs> but I know her whole life story because I love hearing them and I ask a lot of questions and I'm I'm genuinely interested in people's stories. And so, you know, people always laugh because I'll I'll get off of an airplane and I'll know somebody's whole life story or and I think it's partly because I really do care and I'm really interested, but it's partly because I don't judge and I just listen and I empathize and you know, you're I, I work really hard to not judge anybody because because I would have never wanted to be judged myself on on my life stories. So. Yes. And let's explore that a little further, Shirley, because I think that for our listeners to understand how to do that, what are some of the things that you do that help you to stay out of judgment and into curiosity? Like, is there anything that you're conscious of that you do to help you to listen in that way? Well, again, I am genuinely curious I, I, I genuinely want to hear from people. And I honestly think, and I don't know, um, it probably started from a, a, a negative place, but it's be turned into a positive for me is I don't like talking about myself. And so because I avoided talking about myself for so long, I do ask a lot of questions and I do want to hear people's life stories. I had a, a friend of mine who we had been friends for a long time, and I mean like 20 years. And one day I was talking about my family and my siblings, and she said to me, oh, I didn't know you had siblings. And I said, oh, yeah, no, I, I know. I don't really talk about it much. And she said, I've known you for 20 years, and I didn't know you had siblings. I think because I, again, have spent so much of my life not talking about my life that 
Um, it's made me very curious about others and it's given me a way to avoid any, any spotlight on myself. It, look, it's probably why I'm in the career I'm in, which is all about giving other people the spotlight and staying in the background. It's just where I feel most comfortable, you know, so staying out of the spotlight and then having a genuine curiosity about others makes for makes for great conversations with people and they feel cared for and listened to. Mm -hmm. And heard. Yes. Oh, mm -hmm. thank you for that. So as a generous leader, I'm curious to hear some of the life experiences, the stories of, of ways in which you've encountered generosity in the workplace. Yes. So I came to the Cox Company, uh, it'll be six years ago next month. And the Cox Company is really, I, I don't know how many people are familiar with it, but it's a private family owned company. It's been around for over a hundred years. And this company is founded on generosity and it, it, it flows down right from the very, very top. And you you don't, you, you can't really be successful at Cox unless you're a generous leader. So the company itself is completely aligned with my values. And I was able to walk into it and, and feel right at home very quickly. But I remember when, after I interviewed there and I got the job and I was meeting with some of our senior executives after I arrived and I met with uh, one of the senior executives and we had a great meeting. And as we were walking to the door for me to leave, she stopped me and she put her hand on my arm and she said, it's really important to me that you're successful here. So I want you to let me know how I can help you be successful here. And I was so taken back by that because I've never had anybody say that to me on my first meeting with them. And she meant it. And she meant it. And, you know, six years later, this is somebody that I'm still very close to and really did care about my success. But you, you know, I, f I find that Cox is, is naturally great at that. But, um, that was a moment where it was, it was so, I walked out of her office just so, um, struck by it. And it made me want to do that for others. And I have, and I have, as people have come into the company, I use those words and I say, I want you to be successful here. So let me know what I could do to be helpful with that. When we come back, Shirley will share how being supported by that leader made her feel. Hello, I'm Marianne Newell, Assistant Director of College Support at St. Joseph University's Kinney Center for Autism Education and Support. Located in Philadelphia, the Kinney Center has a two-fold mission to educate and train the autism professionals of tomorrow while supporting and serving individuals and families affected by autism today. I'm part of the Aspire College Support Team, helping St. Joseph's University students with autism achieve collegiate success through social and executive functioning support. Learn more about our services by visiting sju.edu slash k-i-n-n-e-y. And we're back with Shirley Powell, SVP Communications and Industry Relations for Cox Automotive. How did that make you feel when she said that to you? Oh my goodness. I would, well, one, I was so struck by it where I was like, well, that's never, nobody's ever said that to me before. Um, and two, I just left with a, a relief, like they're rooting for my success. Like, you know, oftentimes, you don't always feel that with, with coworkers. Um, and I knew she was somebody that I could go to when I was struggling and she ended up being somebody I could go to when I was struggling. Yes. And I think it speaks to that need that we all have for belonging. You know, we hear more about that these days, thank God, than we have ever before. And I think that belonging is like, I want you here. I want to help you be successful. You're not alone. I got you. So you learned a lot from that experience and you have then modeled that behavior for other people joining the organization and telling them that you care about their success. What are some other things that help you to model the kind of behavior that you want to model or to deal with some of the things that come up in interpersonal relationships that can be challenging? Yeah, that's a good question. I um, I am a member of of Andy Stanley's big churches, North Point Ministry. There, He has many, many churches. Andy has done many sermons about, and it's really struck me 
every time I hear him say it is he, he has this concept of, do you care more about the relationship or do you care more about being right? It often, I'll, I'll keep that in the back of my mind, whether it's a, an argument with my husband and, you know, and oftentimes, you know, when you're in it with your husband, you want to be right. Uh, with my children, you know, you absolutely want to be right. And I've had to stop myself and say, do I care more about keeping this relationship positive or do I care more about being right in this relationship? In the workplace, it, of course, it, it goes into, um, effect because there are times when you're in meetings and you're arguing points or you're debating strategies or I have to go to executives and I have to present things and, you know, and I know I'm right. At the end of the day, is it the relationship that you're going to prioritize or is it being right? And I've had to step away from being right many times to keep the relationship. And oftentimes I have not stepped away from being right and the relationship has suffered. I think sometimes you actually have to stop yourself mentally and say, what's more important to me here? Do I want to be right or do I want to maintain this relationship? You don't always have to pick. You know, you're not always in a situation to have to choose, but there are times when you do. And Andy's philosophy and it has become my philosophy is pick the relationship over over being right. Yes. Oh, thank you for that. So powerful. So we had the opportunity to meet originally because of Women in Cable Telecommunications, WICT. I remember we went for a walk early in the morning. I probably told you my life story and you probably didn't know my name. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Probably. Um, And we have been friends ever since. Talk to me about women in leadership. Here we are celebrating Women's History Month. I know you're a huge fan of women leaders. You're a phenomenal female leader yourself. Tell me about your thoughts on women in leadership? Well, women, girls and women are are one of my passion points for sure. You know, again, probably a little bit because of my background. Um, my dad was, was very blue collar and, you know, didn't always think that women could could do the things that that we all do and and would often say these crazy things to me like we would be driving down the uh, the street and and a car would try to cut us off and he would say oh it's a woman driver of course and i would be like uh dad i'm actually you know driving <laughs> i'm actually driving you right now i mean he just i ended up instead of being resentful by it, I ended up just laughing at it because it was so absurd. Now, my dad was in World War II, so I'm going to give him a little bit of, of a break. He's a completely different generation. Um, so I've, I'm have i a huge uh, supporter of girls and women, always have been. And, you know, I've always been um, annoyed, I guess is, is the right word, by this whole narrative that women don't support each other. And that, you know, you'll hear it. You'll hear people say, well, you know, women are catty or women are backstabbing or whatever they are. And I, it's just not something I've experienced personally. I mean, I have had, I have had my most success coming from women who wanted me to be successful. I've also had some uh, you know, bad women bosses. My I, In my list of many, many bosses, I could think of my greatest boss being a woman and my worst boss being a woman. So it's not that all women are perfect. There are some, you know, uh, some women out there who probably aren't. Um, but generally speaking, I have felt the support of women in my personal life, in my professional life. I mean, at Cox, the women are the greatest thing at that company. I mean, we all support each other. We all help each other. We have a, a, a every biweekly, we have a happy hour now on video where it's a lot of the senior women all come together and we just laugh and we share and we complain. And But it is, I, I, I don't know what I would do without the women in yes. my life. What are some of the characteristics and attributes of female leaders in particular that you really resonate with? I think that the willingness to be vulnerable and the willingness to jump in on things uh, just to be helpful. Like I was, I was struck by, there was a story of, and I'm going to get the the person in the state wrong. So focus more on the story than the facts. <laughs> but there was, it, it's a mayor or a governor of a state in, in the Southwest. Recently, I saw that she, they're having a problem with um, 
substitute teachers and teachers, like oh, the whole country is having the problem with teachers resigning and ha- having a hard time staffing and all. And this woman decided she was going to go into the classrooms and teach. She was going to go be a substitute teacher because she sees that her state is having this problem. And she's like, I'm going to see what I, I'm going to be part of the solution. And I love that story. And I also thought, I wonder if that's like, would a man do that? Would a man say like, I'm going to go jump in and teach school? Or would he just come up with a plan for somebody else to do it? I don't, it felt very womanly to me, that generosity of I'm going to jump in, I'm going to fix this, I'm going to help you, I'm going to solve this. Um, It felt like something that a woman leader would do. Yes. Yeah, that willingness to jump in and help knowing you're not going to get it right, necessarily. You're not really the qualified. And that actually is counter to how a lot of women operate. So if she were applying for that job, she may not have jumped in there because she might think she didn't have the qualifications. But maybe there's something around this. When there's a need, I will do whatever I can to be helpful, even when I'm out of my depth on what this thing is. And there was probably also a part of her, I'm speculating, of course, but that wants to know, like, what is it like to be a teacher? Like, I really want to appreciate these these professionals and how better to know than to actually go and do it and have that lived experience, right? So I think there's that like genuine desire to understand what it's like to be in someone else's shoes. And I see that a lot with female leaders as well. And the need to not get the credit, right? Like, you know, I think women in general don't, uh, have, what I have experienced is, you know, they're not always looking to get the credit. In fact, most women have to teach themselves how to how to do that better and how to make sure they do get the credit. They just want to solve the problems and they want to get to the, the bottom of things and they really don't need to be in the spotlight for it. And um, and so I think that plays into it as well. Oh, that, that's beautiful. Thank you. And what a great way for us to celebrate Women's History Month to think about the women in our work lives and our personal lives who demonstrate some of these qualities that you're mentioning and others that we're thinking, my gosh, thank God for these people in my world who model generous leadership and are just such a pleasure to do life with. Yeah, and I do, look, as much as I want to believe that we are, women are are, you know, where they need to be in the professional workplace. I don't think we are. I still think women struggle. Um, I see it, you know, I still think that, you know, there are, um, there are men who, who are not as enlightened as they should be. I still think we're not, we're not in the perfect world yet. But what I love to see in this imperfect world, world is the women supporting each other. Because I think if that doesn't happen, we're never going to make any progress. I mean, if we all stop supporting each other, I mean, we should just give up on it all. The only way we can continue to make progress is to have each other's back and really help each other. Yes, well said. And similarly, like when you spoke about the support of sponsorship of um, help for people who are joining the organization or otherwise, Are there any other ways in which you're intentional about how you're supporting women in the workplace? I am super intentional about people coming into our company because as wonderful and amazing as the Cox Company is, it is a a tough company to join because of the, um, the culture is so ingrained. And when you come into it, you know, it's not always easy to navigate and, and people have worked there a hundred years and everybody's been there forever. And, um, and relationships are such a big part of the company that when you come in without those relationships, it's, it's a little bit harder. And so I have made it my personal mission. And I've told all the HR people at our company this, that when I see people join, um, I do want to kind of be on the welcoming committee and I want to be part of like the new person. You're going to be okay here and, and share with them wisdom of things that maybe mistakes I made or mistakes I see, but others make where they don't make them themselves or, and to help them with context. I mean, so much 
is about context where I want to say to them after a meeting, okay, here's what was going on there. And here's some history and here's some context. Because if you don't have that, it's hard to navigate everything. So um, I am like the unofficial uh, welcoming committee at Cox um, and I do everything I can to help people because I, I of, the, of the difficulties I face myself and that I see others face. And, and I and it's such a wonderful company that I know that if that I want them to see what I see, but it, sometimes you need help in seeing it. Yes, so well said. Thank you for that. So all of our guests share a favorite quote or mantra, something that speaks to them. Yours is from John Lennon. What is, what is your favorite <laughs> quote, Shirley? Yeah, yeah, it may not be the most uh, insightful quote, but I like it because of, of what I do for a living. So it's, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. And I have found, I have this hanging up in my office and I have found that it just, it just encapsulates my life. It encapsulates my job. It encapsulates my my personal life. And, you know, I think I'm walking into my office with my day planned and my meetings planned. And then I get a, you know, a call or somebody standing at my door and the whole day goes, you know, to heck in a handbasket. So um, it just is, it reminds me that even though I think that there's a plan and everything's going to go the way it's supposed to, it never does. And it certainly doesn't when you have children, as you know, when you get those phone calls and you're like, oh, okay, well, this wasn't, this wasn't what I was expecting today. Yes. Um, and that's what life but, is, you know, you're saying, right? That's, that's, that's what life is. And you get through it and you keep going. And, and I've tried to get this with my children because things don't go as they expect. And it just builds resiliency. I mean, and you have to have resiliency to get through life these days. Well, thank you so much for that, Shirley. I think that quote speaks to all of us and a great way for us to look at the unexpected shifts and turns that happen throughout the day and recognize that is, in fact, life. Uh, so thank you for being who you are, for the dear friend and just trusted partner and confidant that you are in my life and for being a guest on our podcast and sharing some of your wisdom with us. Thank you for having me, Shannon. I loved connecting with you again and I loved being part of this. Our OG takeaway tip, how to apply what we've learned to our own work and lives. Shirley shared some real nuggets of wisdom here. Let's focus on these three as we go into the week ahead. Number one, be willing to share your story. Two, clearly and directly offer to support the success of others. And three, avoid judgment. Number one, be willing to share your story. How lovable is Shirley? We just got to learn a small snippet of her story in this episode, but we get a glimpse and want to learn more. Everyone has a story. Think about yours. Where were you raised? How were you raised? Who was in your household? What did you enjoy as a child? What was less than ideal? What are your preferences, orientations, identities? What affects you now? Who influences you? What are your strengths? Like what energizes you? What are your weaknesses? What weakens you? These are part of you, your story. Generously share them with others. Number two, clearly and directly offer support to others. Has anyone ever said to you, it's really important to me that you're successful here. So I want you to let me know how I can help you be successful here. Maybe not in those exact words, but something along those lines. If so, how did that make you feel? Have you paid that forward? Even if you never have experienced that type of direct support, be the change. Be the type of leader and person who gives others the strength of knowing they are seen, respected, and supported. Number three, avoid judgment. This is a big ask and worth it. Shirley taught us that to avoid judgment, we need to stay in curiosity. Like, I wonder how that made them feel. I wonder what that must be like. I wonder how that has impacted them and those around them. Wonder, curiosity, genuine interest and open-mindedness. When you are in a conversation with someone this week, think of it as a new canvas. And as they share information and stories, you begin to see them paint a picture on that canvas. Remember, you don't know what the picture will be. You've only seen a few blots of paint so far. Join us next week with Michelle Meyer Ship, the brand new CEO for Dress for Success Worldwide. 
Until then, stay generous, everyone. Thanks for listening to ROG, Return on Generosity podcast. Please help us grow by subscribing and reviewing us on your favorite podcast player. And for more information, visit bridgebetween.com. We grow when we give. We grow when we give. We grow when we give.